Okay. Well, w welcome to the webinar, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, completion equipment, and it's an introduction to the topic presented by Howard Crumpton. And he will be talking after a brief introduction here. Howard's a completion specialist. Uh, he's you know, one of the world's uh, leading specialists in this area. So, uh, you know, it doesn't get much better than this. And my name is Anastasis Kokinos. I'm the director of Asanda, and we are a, an upstream oil and gas training organization. So, you know, we'd like to talk to you about your learning and development requirements. And we're going to have a QR code up. So if you want to arrange a meeting or a time to talk with me, you can just use the QR code to book a mutually convenient time. And the QR code will be throughout the presentation. So you can pick it up off the um, bottom of the slides as well. Also, we, as you know, we've, well, most of you would know that we've got uh, webinars running throughout the year. And the next one will be especially interesting, of interest to geologists and geoscientists. It's a OJICA, a Com competency initiative for um, geoscientists. And that's coming up on the 22nd of March. Then we've got some topics on the energy transition, climate change, ESG risk management, and then some more subsurface uh, topics, seismic stratigraphy, a minimum safe band and pressure, surf, subsea umbilicals, rises and flow lines of interest to the um, subsea people and engineers and anyone who's interested in field development. Then some more geoscience courses, the role of sealing uh, in trapped oil and gas and gas well performance. As I mentioned, the QR code will be having that uh, presented throughout the um, presentation and you can book a meeting with myself to discuss your learning and development requirements and how we can um, help you with uh, your company's uh, training needs. Finally, just a few um, rules or you know how we'd like to run the webinar. Just we've got all attendees muted but you can ask questions through the chat function and I'll try to answer whatever I can while Howard's talking. And then we can have a question and answer session at the end of the uh, webinar. And we may bring up some of the questions that were raised during the talk if required. If we don't address all the questions due to uh, time constraints, you can follow up by email and we'll uh, respond to all the attendees. We're, we're recording the, seven, the webinar, so afterwards you can share it with your colleagues or staff um, on our YouTube channel. There'll be a link to the YouTube channel, which we'll email to you once it's um, edited. And again, any further questions on the webinar or any training, learning and development requirements, you know, feel free to contact us at uh, training at asandaengineering.com. Okay, so I'll keep that as brief as I can, and I'll hand over to Howard, who will um, introduce himself and the uh, and talk about completion equipment. Okay. So I'll just st stop sharing my screen and hand back over to you, Howard. Okay. Thanks, Anastasis. And I will share. I've, I think I stopped sharing. Yeah. And I think it's... Uh, No, that's wrong. Just... You should now be seeing the, the introductory slide. Not quite yet, Howard. Oh, okay. I wonder why not. Let's try again. That's it. That's, That's it. That's great. Yep. Okay, excellent. Thank you. 
Okay, um, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Howard Crumpton. I'm a completions engineer with, or XBP. I'm just trying to get to the first slide. Here we go. Um, so I've worked in completions and interventions since 1978. I was in various roles with, with BP, uh, initially a well site supervisor. I worked in interventions for a number of years, but most of my career was spent uh, working in completions, completion design of um, both land, platform and subsea wells. And for the last 12, 15 years, I've been conducting training courses for several training agencies. Uh, I teach courses in completion design, in um, completion and work over you know, practical courses on the operational aspects of those disciplines. I also teach um, tubing stress analysis courses using the WellCat software. And uh, 2018, I had a book on well control for completions and interventions published. Um, it's, uh, it's been used quite widely across the industry, quite, quite good sales for a, a, you know, a technical publication. And I'm currently working on a, on a second edition of that for the publishers Elsevier. So that's, that's a, a very brief introduction to myself. Um, what I'd like to cover today in, in the short time we have available to us is to give you an overview of the sort of modern completion um, and concentrate focus on several of the important components that we use in their construction. So we're going to look at things like packers, downhill safety valves, the types of components that are used when constructing a well. You know, so we'll look at um, you know, what these different items of equipment are used for, how they work, where they go in the well, and um, how and why we, we select them. So just um, to, if you'd like to set the scene very briefly, uh, I've got here a, a definition of what a completion is, and it, it's the, the final stage of the well construction process. Uh, it, we, what we're doing is creating the interface between the reservoir, the, you know, the, the formation at the bottom of the well, and, and the top sides. It, it, it's the conduit through which the hydrocarbons flow, or if it's an injection well, through which we inject water or gas. And when we're designing completions and selecting the equipment, we, we you know, for, foremost, we want the thing to be safe. Um, we also want it to be reliable. Uh, we want it to be efficient. We want, we want our wells to be very, very productive. And we need it to be affordable. And th there are some buts here because you know, to make a system safe, it's going to cost more. You know, um, for example, if, if I can make a system more safe by putting a downhill safety valve into the well, a downhill safety valve made from high grade materials, um, you know, a nickel alloy will cost perhaps uh, as much as a quarter of a million dollars. You know, so we're adding significantly to the costs by introducing safety. And if I want a system to be more reliable, it's also going to cost more money. Um, you know, if, if I'm using high grade corrosion resistant alloys for my tubing, for my completion equipment, you know, that that's all adding to the cost. And, and very often things like operability of the system and the reliability of the system will be in conflict. I can, I can design a, a very smart, autonomous system that I, I can operate remotely, but that is going to have impacts on reliability because I'm now introducing into my completion sort of electro-hydraulic systems, systems that don't inherently have reliability. You know, I, I prefer dumb mechanical stuff, but that's not going to give me as much versatility in terms of being able to, to, being able to operate my well. When I'm selecting completion equipment, the, the two main criteria that I'm looking at are the barriers, and this is barriers between the reservoir and surface. It's the things that are, if you like, preventing the well from blowing out, preventing an unconstrained release of hydrocarbons. So, you know, barrier requirements are all about safety and many of my barrier requirements are going to be mandatory. I can't get away from them. I've got to have certain pieces of equipment in the well to re keep the reduced fluids inside the well bore. And the other thing I will look at is flow management. You know, if I have a complex multi-layered reservoir, I may want to be able to produce the zones independently of one another. 
you know, I can commingle flow perhaps for part of the time. Other times I may want to produce from a discrete zone individually. And, and so, you know, I can put things into the well that enable me to do that, enable me to manage the reservoir in a better way. The, the main sort of criteria when I'm selecting individual components will be, uh, as listed here, um, you know, I need, to, I need to be aware of the pressure and the temperature limitations within the well. Um, I need to anticipate what the maximum and minimum flow rates are going to be. Is it a corrosive environment? You know, the more corrosive the, the produced fluids, the higher the grade of material I'm going to use, and that, that's all going to add cost to it. And then, you know, obviously, and finally, the strength of the material. <clears throat> So I will be calculating what the axial loads, burst collapse loads, triaxial loading on each individual component is going to be. So the whole design process and selection of my completion equipment is it, it's very much an integrated approach. You know, as a completion engineer, you're working as part of a team and you're, you're reliant on input from, particularly from reservoir engineering, you know, the understanding the mechanics of the reservoir and how the, the reservoir is going to produce is going to have a big influence on what we design. Um, we also have to integrate the completion. I mean, the completion is a tubing string with associated equipment sitting, in, is sitting inside uh, multiple casing strings. So, you know, I have to be able to fit whatever I'm designing into whatever the drilling engineers have left behind when they've drilled the well. Now, in an ideal world, as a completion engineer, I'm going to design from the inside out. I, I will design my completion and say to the reservoir engineers and the drilling engineers, you know, this is what I've got. You know, can, can you accommodate it? Doesn't always happen, but, you know, that's a nice thing. And we also have to integrate whatever we design into our facilities as well. You know, what am I producing to? Um, if I'm going into a separator, what sort of pressures and temperatures are involved in, in that surface those top sides facilities. So as I say, very, very integrated approach. So let's start with the, the sort of the barrier. I just want to talk for a moment about barriers because th this is one of the main selection criteria. Most operating companies will require you to have two barriers between the reservoir and surface. So if, if we look at a you know, a, a very sort of simplified completion schematic like we have here. Um, I'm just, I, I think you should be able to see my cursor there. In fact, if I just go to, um, you should be able to see that pointer. Um, you know, on, on the annulus side of it, this is, you know, between my production tubing and my first casing string, I need barriers. And very, very typically, uh, the production packer, which is deep in the well, just above the reservoir, will be a mechanical barrier. That is preventing hydrocarbons pressure from entering the annulus. And at the top of the well, a second barrier will be my tubing hanger. This is the, you know, sits in the wellhead and it creates a seal. So, you know, there, there's two barriers there. So any well that's capable of producing naturally, and certainly if it's offshore, will have to have a packer it will have to have a tubing hanger you know that that's pretty much universal through the production tubing you know my barriers will be the valves in the christmas tree so you know at the, at the top of the well we've, we've got a christmas tree a series of valves that is preventing flow or it's allowing flow it's allowing me to open and close control flow from the well again if the well is offshore and if it's capable of producing naturally, it will almost certainly have to have a downhole safety valve. So this is a valve that's positioned a few hundred feet below the seabed, um, and it's a fail-safe valve. If something happens to the platform, if something happens to the tree, if it's knocked off, if there's a fire, the downhole safety valve prevents flow from the well. So you know, these are usually mandatory statutory requirements. We, we can't get away from that. Uh, there is another type of barrier that, uh, so the, the packers, the tubing hangers, the, the tree valves, the downhole safety valve are all integral parts of my completion. Um, you know, they're there for the life of the well. There are other barriers that I can put into the well to, and, and these are temporary. Um, and these are normally in the form of 
plugs that are set through a well intervention, usually using wireline. And they will be used to enable me to, say, remove the tree for, for repairs, something like that. So I can, I can put these into the well. But I need a receptacle for those plugs. And, and again, we'll, we'll come to that in a moment. So, you know, those are the barrier requirements. I can't get away from them. I've got to put them into, the, into certain wells. You know, if the well is capable of flowing naturally, and definitely if it's, if it's an offshore platform well or subsea well, these are mandatory requirements. I've got to have them. The, the other type of equipment is to do with managing flow from the well. So at surface, I manage flow by varying the aperture on a choke to control the volume of flow from the well. Or if I want to stop flow, I can close or open valves on the Christmas tree, wing valves, master valves. Um, you know, th that enables me to control flow. But downhole... I can introduce completion equipment into the well that enables me to vary where the well is producing from. So in, in this illustration on the left-hand side here, what you're looking at is a, a production string made up from production tubing with more than one packer. So we have a production packer, which is my primary well control barrier. But below that and between these producing intervals, we've got intermediate packers. Now what they're doing is enabling me to compartmentalize the reservoir. If I've got a, a complex reservoir with multiple layers in and I don't want to produce them all together, then I can isolate each reservoir zone from the one above, the one below. And between these packers, I can put what we call an inflow control valve, something that I can open and close to produce from individual zones now, I, I can have them all open and co-mingle and flow everything together, or I can, I can produce from each zone individually. So the difference between this and the sort of barrier equipment is if one of these packers fails or if one of these inflow control valve fails and has a problem, then it's not a well integrity issue. It's not going to cause an uncontrolled release of hydrocarbons. It's not going to be something that concerns me with in, in terms of safety. It's of a concern in terms of reservoir management and the operability of the well and the efficiency of the well. You know, it, it's going to cost money because it's gone wrong, but it's not going to compromise safety. So that, that's really the, the, the difference in the two main sort of criteria I use for, for selecting my equipment. Completions can be wonderfully simple or horribly complicated. Um, <laughs> Uh, if, if you look at the, the illustration on the left where my cursor is pointing, that probably accounts for the overwhelming majority of wells across the world. Uh, in the United States, there are around about a million wells on land in the United States, and about three quarters of those will look like this one on the left. But, you know, there's no packer there. Um, there is a, a tubing hanger set, set in the wellhead with a string of tubing hanging off the bottom of it. And this what you're looking at there is the type of completion you would have for beam pump wells, perhaps some electric submersible pump wells. So these are wells that are incapable of flowing naturally. They are subhydrostatic. You know, there's not enough pressure in the reservoir to lift the fluids to surface. So those wells require some sort of artificial lift. Typically, you know, on land in the United States, that would be a, a beam pump, a nodding donkey, some people call it. Now, the, 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 they still, in, in one sense, there are still two barriers there because the, the primary barrier is the tubing hanger seal. It, it's sealing off the production tubing at the top of the annulus. The, the other barrier is simply turning off the pump. You know, if the pump's not working, the well is not producing. So, but if we have a well that's capable of producing naturally, then I need to have a barrier close to the reservoir to prevent reservoir fluids from reaching surface in an uncontrolled way. And, and this is where I start to introduce the packet into the well. So in a very simple naturally producing completion will have a packer in it. Um, it will, it may or may not have a downhole safety valve. The safety valve depends on the location and you know, legislatory requirements. Uh, as we move across to the right, we're getting more complex. You know, uh, coming back again to this one, this is a, a reservoir with multiple layers in it. 
and I'm isolating the layers from one another using a series of packers. Uh, some wells will require what we call sand control. If the formation is very weak, very unconsolidated, if I produce the well naturally, it will start to produce sand and we don't want that to happen. So you know, some wells will have a uh, sand control screens across the reservoir. In wells where we may want to produce zones simultaneously but keep them isolated, we, we can run two strings of tubing. So you know, in this situation, we're using a production packer that has two bores. That enables you to run two strings of production tubing. So we're producing the upper zone here, the upper reservoir layer, through the what we call the short string, and the lower reservoir through, through a longer production string. But you know, this enables me to produce two, com two zones completely independently of one another. The drawback, obviously, is the, the tubing is going to be smaller, so we're going to be more constrained in how much we can produce from each zone. Um, you know, and, and other variations are, th these are, you know, again, types of sand control wells, uh, case hole sand control, frack pack sand control. You know, so so the, some of these wells are quite complex, very expensive to install. Um, very expensive to construct. And, you know, if, if you want to go all the way to the ridiculous end of the, the spectrum, we can have uh, a single well bore with multilaterals coming off it, uh, each lateral controlled from surface through hydraulic umbilicals and stuff like that. You know, we, we can get into very, very complex systems. Um, you know, we can have fiber optic cables in, into each of these legs that are giving continual surface readout of pressures and temperatures, you know, so. Uh, you know, that illustration is showing vertical wells. We, we can take the same sort of degrees of complexity and add to the difficulty by deviating the well. Um, current technologies in North America for the shale gas developments are drilling you know, five, 6,000 foot long horizontal sections with multiple packers isolating different fracture zones. Uh, so, you know, what they're doing in these wells is, is creating multiple fractures between packers to give access to, to the reservoir. So, you know, these systems are, are getting very, very complex indeed in, in some locations. So let's turn now to, to looking at the actual equipment uh, and, and where it's going to be located in the well. So... You know, we, we, in terms of barriers, the essentials we're looking at are the wellhead and the tubing hanger, uh, the production tubing itself, uh, downhole safety valves if they're fitted, and the production packer. And this, this just briefly sort of illustrates where they go. Um, so, you know, my tubing hanger is the, it's a lump of iron that sits in the wellhead and the tubing is connected to it with a threaded connection. And that's supporting the weight of the tubing string. Uh, the tubing itself, and then you know, if we have a downhole safety valve, it's going to be fairly close to surface. We may have chemical injection mandrels, production packers, you know, all, all of this sort of stuff. So what I'm going to do now is just move through each of these components one at a time, a quick look at, at what it does and, and how it works. So at surface... We have the Christmas tree, which I've already talked about. The Christmas tree is a barrier. In most systems, it is the primary well control barrier. By opening and closing the valves in the tree, I'm controlling flow from the well. Beneath the Christmas tree is the wellhead. The wellhead supports each and every casing string. It isolates pressure between the different casing strings. And it gives on a land well or a platform well, it gives me access to the annulus. So I can monitor annulus pressure. I can, if pressure starts to build up in the annulus, I can bleed it off. In subsea wells, you don't have that access to the outer annulus. But um, you know, that, that's getting into too much detail. The other thing that the wellhead does is supports the Christmas tree. And during the drilling of the well, it supports the, the BOP. Beneath the wellhead and hanging from the, the tubing hanger is 
my production tubing. So if I'm designing completion, I'm going to select my production tubing principally on size. Um, and the, the size is based on what I expect the well to be able to produce. You know, the more productive the well is going to be, the bigger the tubing is. And, and there have been some very large tubing strings indeed run. Um, BP in Trinidad a number of years ago were running nine and five eighths diameter production tubing. Now, most, most of the tubing that perhaps some of you will be working with will be the two and seven eighths, three and a half, four and a half, five and a half inch. Those are the sort of size ranges that most reasonably productive wells are working in. But we, we can go larger. It's not uncommon to run seven inch diameter pipe as, as production tubing. So I will select my tubing size based on how productive I expect the well to be. Uh, the other thing I have to consider, though, is depletion and increasing water cut. As the fluid in the tubing becomes more dense and as the reservoir pressure depletes, it's going to be harder and harder for it to flow. And if the tubing is too large, the, the well will simply cease to produce. So th there's always a balance to be struck between you know, wanting big tubing for high rate and small tubing for more stability. I'm going to be concerned about the strength of the material um, and the strength is determined by the yield of the, the metal and the, the thickness of the wall. And then I'll be looking at corrosion resistance. Um, carbon steel is cheap, cheerful, plentiful, um, but it will corrode very, very quickly if there's a lot of CO2 or, or perhaps H2S in the well. So uh, as the environment becomes more corrosive, then I have to select materials that are more corrosion resistant. And you know, the, the high end of the spectrum is, is nickel alloys. You know, and they are typically about 35% nickel, 25% chrome. So very, very expensive, but extremely robust, extremely hard wearing. So that, that's my main sort of selection criteria for the tubing. Uh, the connections um, for most high pressure, high value wells, we will be using what we call premium connections. And premium connections have a metal to metal seal. So as, it's t as the, the pipe is made up, as it's torqued together, uh, the seal faces, uh, metal to metal seal faces, form a very, very robust gas tight seal. It's more expensive than what we call these API connections, which are rely on thread interference to create a seal, that they are not gas tight. But you know, they're used for the overwhelming majority of wells across the world. They're cheap and cheerful. In wells that are capable of producing naturally, and if they are offshore, it is normally mandatory to have a Surface Controlled Subsurface Safety Valve, SCSSSV. Uh, other abbreviations people use are DHSV for downhole safety valve. You know, there's lots of different names for the same thing. It's a fail-safe valve that's located typically two to 300 feet below the mud line if it's a subsea well, you know, a few hundred feet below surface if, if we're on land. It requires hydraulic pressure supplied from surface to keep it in the open position. And if that hydraulic pressure fails, either because you've, you've initiated a shutdown or because something's happened to the, the top side's facilities, then the valve will close. Almost all safety valves today use a flapper. Uh, older types used to use a ball valve, uh, um, but you know, th there is a, f a closure mechanism here. That valve closes and shuts off production from below the valve. So as I said, they're normally placed a few, two to 300 feet below surface. It varies depending on, on company requirements and you know, on the philosophy of whoever's designing completion. There is a limit on maximum depth, but there's no real limit on how shallow you can put it. But we want it far enough below surface that's going to protect the top side's facilities. The, there are two main types of safety valve that are in use today. Um, one we call tubing retrievable. The tubing retrieval valve is run as part of the production tubing, and it has pretty much the same internal diameter as the pipe. These are far more reliable, and they have a much larger bore through them, so they're less restrictive to flow. Uh, the other type is a retrievable valve, so it's run inside the production tubing and located in a what we call a nipple profile set on it. So, 
something like this one at the bottom, you know, it sits inside the production tubing. The, the principal operation is the same. Um, you know, if you understand how the tubing retrieval valve works, you know how the wireline retrievable valve works. The, the difficulty with the wireline retrievable valve, it, it becomes a choke to flow. And it's not as reliable. It's easy to change because it's, it's a simple intervention using, uh, you know, it's lowered into the well on wire and recovered on wire. Um, but typically it'll need to be changed every year. The tubing retrieval valve, we expect to last for the life of the well. And, and modern valves are very, very reliable, very robust, very well made, very, extremely well engineered. The other, so if you like, mandatory piece of equipment that you may come across, we've already discussed, is the packer. The packer is normally located close to the, the top of the producing zone, so deep in the well down here, and it creates a seal between the production tubing and the casing. So it's protecting my annulus from produced fluids, from corrosive fluids, from reservoir pressure. Uh, Fundamentally, there are three types of, of packers, permanent, what we call permanent releasable and retrievable. Uh, permanent packers are, once they're set, they're set, they're never coming out again. The only way we can remove them is to actually drill and mill them out. So, you know, when I'm designing, I'm, I'm considering, you know, is it likely that I'm going to have to be retrieving the completion and replacing it at some time in the future? So, they're cheap, they're robust, uh, they have a good through ball, you know, they're, they're quite wide in diameter. And so they're, they're normally the first choice if, if we don't think we're going to have to recover the production tubing on, on a frequent basis. For certain types of completion, though, we will use what we call the permanent releasable packer. So this has a, has a great degree of strength. It's a very robust packer, but it can be recovered from the well it normally requires some type of intervention to operate a release mechanism, and then it can be pulled out with the production tubing. And then the retrievable packer, I just take a straight pull on my production tubing and it will come out of the well. But we tend not to use these very often because they're inherently weak. Um, the, the packers can be different ways of setting them. Um, most that we run a hydraulic set, we, we pressure up the production tubing and the packer will set. And when a packer sets, there are a set of, of slips, which I'm, I'm pointing out at the moment. These come out and bite, bite into the casing wall. And the, the seal element is normally a, a nitrile elastomer. That will extrude and create the seal. So the slips are holding the thing in place. Uh, the seal element is creating the seal. So in terms of selecting packers, you know, my, my main selection criteria is going to be the load retention capability. Because as the, the well undergoes temperature and pressure changes induced by production, you know, the tubing is going to go into tension, it's going to go into compression, and, and that load is being transferred onto the packer. So my packer needs to be able to withstand that axial uh, tension and compression. It also needs to be able to withstand any pressure differential between the reservoir and the pressure in my annulus. And pressure di differential can be from above, it can be from below, depending on what's happening in the, in the annulus. In some wells, the loads, in port uh, the loads coming from the tubing onto the packer will be greater than the packer or and or the tubing can resist, in which case, one of the get arounds from, from that is to put a seal assembly. So what we have is a, you know, screwed onto the top of the packer will be a seal bore and the production tubing is stabbed into the seal bore using a set of dynamic elastomer seals. So that allows the tubing to expand and contract as temperatures and pressures change. And that takes a lot of the load off the packer. Um, it, it, there are obvious consequences to that. One is that the, the seals can start to leak. The other one is you're, you're replacing sometimes uh, high axial tension in the tubing string with high axial compression because the, the, the PBR, the seal assembly, forms a, a piston. And so, you know, th there are trade-offs, but that's, that's all part of the design process. 
Uh, the, the final thing I want to look at in terms of barriers is the, the wireline lock and the wireline nipple. So nip, wireline nipples are located at several points in most completions. We almost always have a, a profile machined into the tubing hanger itself. Uh, if the downhole safety valve is a tubing retrieval valve, there will almost certainly be a wireline nipple profile included in that. And typically we will have a third profile in the tubing below the packer. And the main function of these is to allow us to put temporary barriers in. If I want to remove the Christmas tree and put the drilling BOP in place, or at the end of the completion of the well, if I want to remove the BOP, I need mechanical barriers in the well. And typically the first mechanical barrier we'll have will be a plug located in the tubing hanger. So that gives me a, a barrier against the reservoir. I can now safely remove my drill BOP and install a Christmas tree. Uh, placing a nipple profile below the packer is usually done as a, an aid to setting the packer when I'm running the completion. So by putting a plug in this nipple profile, I can apply pressure to my production tubing and that will hydraulically set the packer. And it's also a, an integrity test of the tubing itself. So the, the actual nipple itself, the nipple profile, is just a, a short length of heavy wall pipe with this profile machined in it. And to be able to set a plug in that, I need a lock mandrel. Now, the lock mandrel is, has a profile that matches the profile of the nipple. And on the bottom of this lock mandrel, I can put different devices. I can put a downhole safety valve. I can put a, a plug cap to actually plug the well off. And this is run into the production tubing and located in the nipple using wireline. So it's lowered in on, a, on, on wire. It's, it's set into location using a specialized setting tool. And it can be recovered again when there's no further need for the plug to be in place. So that those are really the fundamental barriers. We've looked at the wellhead, the, uh, the production tubing, downhole safety valves, packers, and nipples. Uh, the remaining few things I want to quickly look at are equipment that's used for flow management. We, in the reservoir, some wells will be completed what we call open hole. In other words, there's no, there's no casing, um, uh, there's no cement. Uh, others, we have cased hole. You know, we, we put casing across the reservoir, we cement it in place and we perforate it. In open hole, we use swell packers and open hole packers. And this is for compartmentalizing the reservoir. It's for separating the different producing zones within the reservoir. Um, swell packers, are they've been around the industry for about 20, 25 years now. And... They're, they're a very attractive proposition for the completion engineer because they're extremely simple. They have no moving parts. The, the swell packer works by bonding an elastomer to the outside of my production tubing, and that elastomer will swell, it expands on contact with, now we can make them water sensitive, we can make them oil sensitive. So once that thing's on, on depth, once it's situated where it needs to be in my open hole, perhaps between two different producing zones, over time, and it, we're talking about you know a few tens of hours, it will swell up and create a barrier between two different producing zones. Um, so as I say, no moving parts, very, very attractive piece of equipment. Once it's set though, it's set, it's not coming out again. So you know it's very, very permanent. Uh, and these are capable of holding high differential pressures you know, as much as 10,000 psi, which is you know exceptional. It, it, very unlikely you're going to get that sort of differential between two reservoir layers, but you know that potential exists. The, the other benefit with these, they can be used in what we call intelligent or smart completions, where I've got lots of different zones and lots of different in, you know, hydraulically controlled inflow control valves. Those inflow control valves need hydraulic lines to operate them. And the hydraulic lines can be embedded in the elastomer itself. So, um, you know, it actually makes for very, very quick and easy completion installation. Uh, the other type of 
packer that's used in open hole is it's, it's simply called an open hole packer. And these look very, very like a, a permanent packer that's used in a cased and perforated well. Um, these are mainly being used nowadays in the shale gas developments that are happening in the United States. And mostly hydraulic set and individual wells can have upwards of 30 of these. You know, it's not unusual nowadays to have 30 or 40 individual fractured producing zones in, in these shale gas development wells. We need to be able to get hydrocarbon from the reservoir into the production tubing between our isolation packers. And that is achieved using what we call inflow control valves. Some people call them interval control valves. Different vendors use different terminology, but they all basically do the same thing. Um, if I have a, uh, and this is a, a, what we call a smart multilateral completion in this illustration on the left here. I have a packer, another packer here. So these packers are isolating the producing zone. And between the packers will be an, what they're calling it an interval control valve. This is actually an illustration from a, a, a Baker catalog. Um, some people call it an inflow control valve, but that valve can be controlled from the surface either through multiplexing electrohydraulic systems or through direct hydraulic control. Um, and this is an illustration of the type of valve that's being used. So th these white lines here are the control lines. They're supplying hydraulic pressure to the valve. By pressuring up on the open line, we, we can open the valve and pressure up on the control on the closed line, we, we can close the valve. The, these valves come in different degrees of sophistication. The simplest are direct hydraulic control, open or close. But it's possible nowadays to get variable position chokes or even inf infinitely variable chokes. The more complexity, the less reliable it's going to be. So th that's you know, what we call a smart completion or intelligent completion component. Um, there, are a there is a mechanical equivalent, which the industry calls a sliding sleeve. And the sliding sleeve is open and closed using mechanical manipulation. And the mechanical manipulation tool is, again, it's deployed on wireline. So it's lowered into the well on slick line, um, you know, impact against the, the shifting sleeve, uh, against a collar inside the thing, opens or closes the thing. In addition to, if you like, the, the basic flow management equipment, you know, our, our zonal isolation packers and our inflow valves, we can put other equipment in to aid production from the well. Uh, very, very widely used in subsea and downhole, uh, uh, sorry, subsea wells is downhole chemical injection systems. In my opinion, this is something that the industry should be running more of because it's it, it's not a huge incremental cost. And managing some of the problems this is designed to rectify can be very, very costly in terms of capex. So what we do with downhole chemical injection systems is we run a mandrel, which is part of the production tubing, and attached to that mandrel is a capillary line, usually a quarter inch or three eighths inch diameter. And what that enables me to do is continually pump uh, inhibition chemicals. What we're inhibiting against is usually wax, scale, or hydrates. Subsea wells nowadays, almost, almost all wells without exception will have, have hydrate inhibition in them. But you know, depending on the production and chemistry, you, you can slow down or, disper or prevent scale formation and also wax formation. This, this is a great way of doing it. You know, if you don't have downhole chemical injection, then you're reduced to having to pump chemicals in from surface down the production tubing. And that can be you know, very damaging to the productivity of the well. So chemical injection, a great system, as I, I think not used nearly enough. Uh, the other thing that can be very, very beneficial for the management of the reservoir is by having downhole data acquisition, principally downhole pressure. Um, again, this is a, a mandrel that is run as part of my production tubing. Uh, 
an instrument cable is attached to it. It's normally a quarter inch stainless steel line with, with, with a, a conductor running through it. And that is giving me 24, hour day, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, surface readout of my reservoir pressure. And for reservoir engineers, that's an invaluable piece of information. Uh, widely used in subsea wells, and in some jurisdictions, they are mandatory. Um, so Western Australia, the regulatory authorities there insist on downhole pressure temperature gauges being introduced in subsea wells. Um, side pocket mandrels are, again, this is a, a mandrel that's run as part of my production tubing. These are very, very widely used. Uh, the most common application is for gas lift. So if I have a side pocket mandrel, inside the mandrel will, is, is a valve pocket, and I can place a valve in that pocket. That valve can be uh, set or recovered from that mandrel when it's in the hole, again, using wireline. The most common application is, is for gas lift. If I pump gas down the, the, the annulus, it goes through the gas lift valve, and what I'm doing is continually injecting my produced fluids with hydrocarbon gas. That reduces the density of the fluid in the tubing, enables the well to produce more efficiently you know, um, you know, at a lower reservoir pressure. And there are hundreds of thousands of gas lift wells across the world using this, this type of technology. But I can also use these side, side pocket mandrels for uh, chemical injection. And I can also use them as a circulation path. If I want to circulate fluids between my annulus and tubing or vice versa, then I can use it for that purpose. And lastly, um, a lot of the equipment we've looked at requires control lines. Um, downhole safety valves require hydraulic control lines. Uh, the in interval control valves or inflow control valves require either a hydraulic or a, an electro-hydraulic system. Uh, downhole pressure temperature gauges, the conductor carrying the data is usually contained within a quarter inch stainless steel capillary line, chemical injection lines. Yeah. So all of this requires control lines and the, the method that the industry uses nowadays for the deployment of these control lines is to encapsulate them. So most of these control lines now will be, as, as you can see in this illustration, they're encapsulated in a hard plastic. The principal reason for doing that is to reduce vibration. In the early days of the North Sea, we discovered that a lot of our control lines, which were just quarter inch bare stainless steel lines, clamped to the outside of the tubing with some very rudimentary clamps. A lot of these things were breaking um, and they were breaking at the splash zone near, uh, at sea level because of vibration. By encapsulating them in plastic and, and using well-designed clamps to hold them onto the tubing, that problem was eliminated. So, you know, the, the, the final part, if you like, of, of the equipment selection will be what type of control lines are made. Um, it's, it's common nowadays also to bundle the control lines together. So if I've got an instrument cable and a chemical injection cable and you know, a hydraulic supply to one of my downhole inflow valves, I can bundle those three lines together into what we call a flat pack. It makes it much, much easier to deploy the completion. Because um, you know, I'm, now I'm only worrying about a single line rather than three individual lines far less likely to be damaged, much, much easier to install the well. And, so, and, and the clamps themselves, uh, most clamps are designed to sit across tubing connections, and we call those across coupling clamps. And they will be designed or, or built in compliance with your flat pack and control line requirements. So, uh, so what I've covered very briefly are the main types of completion equipment you're likely to come across if, if you're working in the sort of upstream side of the industry. There is a lot more um, that, we, that we simply don't have time to cover in, in the short time we have available to us. Um, you know, some of those are listed there. So if you want to know more, then uh, Asanda have several completion design or sort of completion practices type courses available, uh, many of which I teach myself. 
um, other good sources of information, uh, SPE papers. Um, but perhaps the, the best source of information for, you know, specifically for completion equipment are vendor websites. Uh, Schlumberger, Weatherford, um, Halliburton, Baker have very, very good websites. Uh, there's a huge raft of information there. It's freely available. Um, you know, it, it's uh, easy to access. So um, that's me finished. Uh, I think we we can open it up to questions now. If if yep, that's right, uh, Howard. We we didn't have any uh, questions come through during the the webinar, so p feel free to ask your questions. We'll, we'll take them through chat so that we don't turn everybody on um, voice because it can get very confusing. Uh, are you okay with that, Howard? Or yeah, yeah, that's yeah. fine. I'll just um, I'll just close that down so I can. Uh... So, you know, feel free to send your questions through. Oh, okay. Can you see the question there, Howard, in the uh, chat? Okay, yep. Yeah. Um, so how do we really run the control lines from surface? Uh, the, the way that happens is like at the rotary table on the, on the drill floor, the the mandrel that needs the control line is going to be picked up. So for example, it might be a chemical injection mandrel that will be picked up and made up into the, into the production tubing. The control line is connected to it with a compression fitting, um, stainless steel fitting. And then as the tubing is run, the control line is coming off a spooler. So it, it's, it goes up over a shiv in the derrick. Um, and as the tubing is being run into the well, it's being spooled into the well. Then uh, at each tubing connection, a clamp will be placed around the tubing and that will hold the, the control line onto the production tubing. When we get to the, if you like, the top of the well, the tubing hanger, the control line will be cut and connected to a port through the tubing hanger, again, using a compression fitting. The, the control line is then sort of routed out through the either through the wellhead or through the, the block of the tree, depending on the, the design and the location. Um, so that's how that's done. Any more? No, just a couple of uh, compliments. Okay. Okay, there's another question. Which is this the, the barrier question? What is the main first barrier in completion? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, it really uh, it really depends on the completion design. In most completions, the well, we, it it's a difficult question to answer because we we need to differentiate between what we call the barrier envelope and the barrier elements. So the barrier envelope would include all of the production tubing, um, and the, but generally speaking the first barrier in most completions is going to be the packer. Um, but then the, the tubing itself forms a, a whole barrier envelope. Um, in a, in, if we go back to, if you think back to the slides, the, the very, very simple example where we just had a tubing hanger with a string of tubing hanging off the bottom of it, then the, the first barrier is going to be the tubing hanger. So it, it's very, very much dependent. The, the, the simple way to think about it is if you look at a completion schematic and look at the first piece of equipment that's coming into contact with a hydrocarbon, that, that is your primary barrier. That's your first barrier. And the secondary barrier will be if, if that primary barrier were to fail, you know, where is the hydrocarbon going next? Um, th there is uh, an excellent document, which is a free download. You can get it off the, the Internet. Uh, it's called NORSOK, N-O-R-S-O-K, which is the Norwegian Regulatory Authority. They have a, um, a document called D010, and it's to do with barriers in wells. And in that document, it defines exactly how to look at barriers, um, where it, so it differentiates between the, if you like, the whole pressure containment envelope 
and the individual components within that envelope. So it calls it the pressure containment envelope and the the elements within that envelope. It's it's a really really good document. Uh, you know, for those of you that are interested in completions, it's definitely worth a download. So it's NORSOC D zero one zero, and it's it's barrier requirements, uh, and it's what most of the industry are using now as standard. Uh, most completion engineers, when when they're writing completion programs, are putting barriers uh, barrier drawings into their programs that are in accordance with the NORSOC recommendations there are a few questions that have just come through uh howard yep. one with my favorite uh oil and gas acronym as well but uh, i'll let you explain that uh which one was it is it recommended to perforate during completion or we poo and run a wire line to do so from sake al tamimi uh 953 okay yeah, yeah. yeah. um that, that again, very, very difficult to give a short answer to that. Um, the advantages of a, a lot will depend on the completion design. There are advantages to perforating before the completion is run. In that, you can run bigger perforating guns. Therefore, you can you can get uh, a more productive well. However, to do that normally means running TCPs, you know, tubing conveyed perforating guns. That requires you to either perforate with kill fluid in the well and then and or kill the well again afterwards. Um, if you perforate once the completion's in place, then it's much simpler, but depending on the design of the completion, you may have to run smaller guns because whatever you run is going to have to be able to go through the production tubing. So it, there's, there's no right or wrong answer to that. It, a lot will depend on the potential productivity of the well, the design of the completion. Okay. The next question is, uh, could you explain again what an open hole completion is? Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, very, very simply, uh, most completions are what we call cased and perforated. In other words, we will run pipe across the reservoir and pump cement. So there is a cement bond between the outside of the tubing and the inside of the borehole. So you, you, you've drilled a hole, it, it, it's got nothing in it. Um, you put pipe in that hole and then you cement that pipe into place. That is what we call cased well. And to get that well to produce, we need to perforate. So we'll, we'll fire perforating charges, you know, punch holes in the, in the casing and that enables the well to, to produce. Anything else is what we call open hole. So open hole could be what, what some operators will call barefoot. In other words, they, they drill through the reservoir with the drill bit, pull the drill string out of the hole and, and just leave it at that. You know, just, you know, there's absolutely nothing in there. In other designs, we will put pipe in the hole, but pipe is not cemented in place. That may be gravel pack wells, it may be you know, just um, what we call slotted liner type completions. It's just some some pipe with with holes drilled, pre-drilled in it. So basically, the difference between open and cased and perforated, an open hole is anything that isn't cemented in place. Is is a short answer to that. Okay. The next question is from Martin Ferguson. I don't know if you see that. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I'm just reading. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's um. So we're saying you know, years ago we, we did periodic integrity tests while we were running the completion. Now, when I started working in the industry forty years ago, um, I can remember you know, I was running slick line and working on wells in the Middle East. Every two thousand feet of pipe we ran, we'd put a plug in and test, and then we'd pull the plug out again. Um, with modern connections with premium connections, metal to metal seals, it's very, very unlikely that they're going to leak. Um, and when I worked for BP in the 19, early 1990s, we actually did a, a, a cost benefit analysis of all the wireline test. So to, to put a plug in the well to test it, we need wireline, we need to run the plug in, um, set the plug, pull wireline out of the hole, do the pressure test, pull the plug back out. That's going to take quite a few hours. And we looked at the number of leaks we had in premium connection tubing. And I think on about 25 wells on the platform I was working at the time, there were none. 
Um, and then we looked at the amount of time we'd spent running wire in and out of the hole to put these plugs in place. And inevitably what happened, you'd run the plug, the, um, you'd pressure up the tubing, there would be a leak. And the first thing you suspect is the plug's leaking, which is probably the case. So you pull the plug out, rerun it, now you get a good test and so on and so on. And we had spent hundreds and hundreds of hours integrity testing tubing that was sound. Um, and all of the leaks that we recorded were the plugs themselves. It was the barriers we were putting in the well to prove the integrity of the well. Nowadays, what most operating companies are doing is simply um, doing a, a final test once everything's on depth. It, it's a much, much more efficient way of doing it. I, I, it might not be the same if you're using API type connections, but with, with modern premium connection tubing, you know, uh, that's been made up with torque turn analysis on the rig floor, you know, electronic monitoring of the, the torque. Um, it, it's, it's very, very unlikely to leak. You know, the thing that's going to leak is the barrier you put in to test the efficiency of the tube or the integrity of the tubing. Um, yeah, Olga's uh, answered, uh, sorry, I was going to say Olga's yeah. answered the next question. I thought you'd finish there. Sorry, Howard. Yeah, um, the, the NORSOC guideline. Yeah. Yeah, DO10, exactly. yeah. is that right? Yeah. D, it's D010. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And it, it, yeah, so if you, if, you, if you Google that, you'll get a PDF download of it. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Then Francis has asked, when do we perforate, overbalanced or underbalanced? Um, short answer to that, if you can perforate underbalanced, always do. Um, it's better for the reservoir. But there will be circumstances where it becomes impossible to do. Um, you know, just, you know, the cost and the logistics of being able to perforate underbalanced will sometimes prohibit it. Um, the short answer to that, though, is underbalanced perforating is always better for the reservoir. Yep. Okay. Next one is how does a sour service environment impact the design of the completion? Um, really just with material selection. Um, th th there are two uh, options. Um, the, I mean, one way of combating H2S uh, corrosion is to reduce the yield of the material. So a more, <clears throat> more ductile material is more resistant to H2S attack. But if you need high strength, then we need to use uh, alloys that will resist stainless steel, uh, so resist um, sour, uh, sour attack. And fundamentally, it's putting nickel into, into the steel. That's your combat against. So we're having to use uh, stainless steel alloys with with um, uh, a nickel content in them, uh, and that impacts cost. You know, it, it's going to cost a lot more to make the material sour service. Yeah. The next question is: What what if a leak develops? I guess it's a fairly general question, but uh... yeah. Um, it, it depends where the leak develops. <laughs> and going back to, to what I was saying in, in, the, in the presentation, if it's a barrier leak, then it needs to be repaired. And certainly, you know, if, if it's a, a well that's capable of flowing to surface, particularly if it's subsea, if, your, for example, your packer starts to leak, that is a compromise of your primary barrier. So you're narrow line on your secondary barriers. Most operating companies and most regulatory jurisdictions will insist on repair of primary barrier failure as soon as possible. If the leak is, for example, on one of your inflow control valves or one of the packers that's between reservoir zones, then if it's not a safety concern, if it's simply one of operability, one of reservoir management, then it becomes a financial decision. Can you live with it? And very often the cost of fixing it is going to be more than the cost of living with it. So, you know, if it's, if it's a barrier and it leaks, it needs to be fixed. If it's a, um, a flow management piece of equipment that leaks and it's not compromising the safety of the well, then it becomes a financial, you know, a, a reservoir management decision. Yep. The next question is, how do you confirm that the packer has fully sealed? Um, uh, for the, if you like, the, the well control packer, the uppermost packer, uh, it's, it's simply doing pressure testing. Yep. Um, so we pressure test the annulus, uh, or we can, if the 
uh, casing below is unperforated, we can pressure down the tubing and, and look for pressure coming back up on the backside. So it, it's simply pressure testing. Yeah. Uh, we, we can also, depending on whether or not, or how the pack is being set, we can take an overpull on the string as well. The next question, is metal to metal seal the future as it's a premium product? And uh, what is the difference in cost to conventional seals? Um, increasingly now metal to metal seals are, I mean, they're all over our completions. They're in the wellhead, they're in the tree. Uh, they're on many of the things like the downhill safety valves rely on metal to metal sealing. All of the, the uh, connections in the well, if we're using premium connections. So yeah, um, you know, it, you know, unless I've got a very benign, low pressure environment, I, I would be looking at metal. It, it's, um, th there is now a sort of a leak resistance classification where, and, and sort of A0 leak is, is um, you know, high temperature, high pressure gas. Yeah, and, and most of the manufacturers now are striving to get very, very high leak resistance classifications into completion equipment. Um, I mean, it, it, it used to cost a lot more to have metal-to-metal -metal technology. Now it's becoming so widespread that yeah, I think you'd, you'd be hard pushed to buy a, something like a wellhead, certainly a compact spool wellhead, without having metal-to-metal -metal sealing in it. Yeah. yeah, the next question is, how reliable are swallable packers? Because you mentioned that they're not removable. Yeah. Um, it's th This is a... A bit of a tricky one because in most cases swell packers are being used for isolation between zones so it's very likely that across the industry there are a number of these that have failed and we don't know about it you know or the only way you know about it is by doing some very very sort of extensive and, and intrusive well testing um with with downhole production logging and stuff like that it would be difficult to, uh, but but the the consensus across the industry is they are, they're pretty reliable. They're pretty good. Um, yeah. Then we've got, what is the difference between conventional and intelligent completion? Uh, with an intelligent completion, you're able to isolate or open up production from different zones from surface, basically using hydraulic control lines. With a conventional completion, if I've got an inflow control valve between two packers and I want to open or close it, I would have to use Y-line. Um, now, if you're on a land operation or a platform operation, it's relatively easy to rig up Y-line and go in and, and, and open or close a, a producing zone. But if your well is subsea, it's going to cost millions of dollars to do that same operation because I've got to put a rig over the well or a, you know, a well intervention vessel and run riser or run a subsea lubricator and run in with wireline to do it. To do the same operation on land is going to take an afternoon and cost a couple of thousand dollars. Uh, to do it subsea is going to cost millions of dollars, literally millions of dollars. So if I have a smart completion, an intelligent completion, I can do that sort of uh, opening or closing of production from a particular zone simply by applying pressure to a control line or sending a signal to uh, a multiplex electrohydraulic system. Um, uh, Saudi Aramco a few years ago were experimenting with being able to open and close production from different zones from a laptop in somebody's office using you know telemetry to uh, receiving equipment on, on the wellhead. So, you know, the smart completions can be extremely sophisticated. The price you're paying though is reliability. You know, a, a simple direct hydraulic control or a simple mechanical interface is going to be a lot more reliable than, than some very complex multiplex uh, control operations. Yep. There are three more questions and I'd like to yep. probably close it at that. And any, any okay. further questions you can send in by email. Um, yeah. I'll let you read them off. This one's a, a, a bit yeah. longer, so I'll let you read that. Uh, for offshore completions, if it's subsea, then you're looking at a full sort of semi-submersible, heavy-duty drilling rig, um, generally, anyway. And for, for most subsea operations, the the completion will be run from the same uh, floating unit that, that has drilled the well. Not, not necessarily always, but, but typically. Um, you, 
you may be able to get away with a lighter vessel if it's simply just to run the completion. But um, you, you need uh, pumping capability for circulation of fluids. You need the drawworks capability of carrying the the whole load of the completion. And and some completions, um, you know, the, the string weight can be quite heavy. You, you could be looking at, you know, 15, 18,000 feet of, um, you know, seven inch, 29 pound per foot tubing and all the associated jewelry that goes with it. So, so generally speaking for, for running completions, um, nine times out of 10, we're running them with the same unit that's been used to drill the well. So it's, it's usually heavy. Uh, for carrying out interventions though, um, if it's just wireline interventions, then, then we can use um, very light equipment. Um, a lot of wireline interventions in subsea wells now are being carried out from, from mono, mono hull vessels um, with, with through water wireline and using a wireline lubricator that's on the seabed. Okay. Um, the next one's after the hole yeah. is drilled. Yeah. So I was let you read that, yeah. No, um, I mean, most of the, well, the, the wells we've been talking about today, um, the, the assumption is that they will produce naturally. So, you know, what, once the completion is in place, then the, if you like, the, the heavy fluid that's used, that's in the hole during the running of the completion will be, circulated out uh if we do we sometimes use nitrogen we, we would not use compressed air because it's explosive you know it, it it has oxygen in it so it is not safe to use we often use nitrogen to um reduce the density of the the fluid in the well bore that enables the well to start flowing and then once it starts flowing it, it just keeps going it keeps going naturally there's a question in there from Simon Shaheen. I'm not sure I understand it, so Simon might have to clarify, but if you want to read that, uh, how it, it's uh, just after his uh, thanks for the webinar. I think he might be getting at what's left behind down hole, you know, is it? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, well, uh, the, the equipment that's left in the well at the end of abandonment, um, it it's probably too deep to cause any uh that there is a, a, a sorry a requirement when wells are abandoned to remove most of the production tubing the stuff that we do leave in the well um typically the sort of production packer and the small bit of tubing beneath it above that will be a cement plug the cement plugs have to meet minimum requirements the, in in you know in most wells it's so deep below surface that it's not going to cause any sort of leaching type pollution that you, you know, um, you, like you get in a landfill. I mean, a landfill is very close to surface. The, the equipment we're leaving behind in abandoned wells is so far beneath surface that, that uh, that's not an issue. Okay. I, I think that's it. And I've let everybody know that they can uh, email us if they've got any questions they think of afterwards or when they you know, visit the, the, the YouTube um, channel, which we'll post in the next day or so once we've um, downloaded the recording. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks, um, Howard. I'm going to hang back for a minute or two to talk to anyone who wants to discuss their training requirements or book a meeting to discuss them. Um, so, you know, it's over to you. If you've got any questions for me about training on completions or any other, you know, upstream topic, which we cover, you know, please go ahead.